involved. You see, oil, oil, oil spill, ordinarily, like I've always said, it's supposed to be an accidental thing. But here we have a situation where we have oil spill in the past, virtually on a daily basis. Uh, with our activities, with the number of, uh, with the amount of efforts we are put in place, doing what we call disaster reduction um, uh, management, it has been such that the number of spills we have these days have tremendously reduced. Reduced to the extent that, unlike before, when people get uh, aggrieved the, about any activities of an oil company, they just go there, vandalize the equipment. Vandalism has reduced to, to, to a very low level. However, it would have even reduced more, but for the activities of the oil thieves. So we will separate oil theft from willful uh, damage to oil facilities by the communities. From the community side, it has reduced. The criminals are now who the operatives, the security operatives are running after those who go to steal crude oil. All equipment failure. Equipment failure in the sense of maybe a rupture of a pipeline as a result of corrosion. There will be what we call compensation and there will be cleanup and remediation where necessary. But if it is the reverse, as a result of vandalism, there will be cleanup and remediation, but there will be no compensation. So in most cases, you see uh, be between the oil companies and the host communities arguing about the cost. About the cost, whether because you know if if it is if it is not equipment failure, that means it's vandalism and nothing will be paid. So we always find a very very critical balance when it gets to that, and we have had cause to go forensic in a number of occasions, uh, such that uh, we, we convince everybody beyond reasonable doubt that this is the cause. These aspects have gone down considerably. So we give credit to the host communities in that regard. And that is because they, are now, they now see the importance of keeping the environment safe and clean. Because where there is a spill, yes, there will be clean up, in some cases recovery, if the oil, the oil is very massive, recovery, clean up, and then remediation. But it takes time. In other words, for the time period it takes for the land to heal, you will not be able to make use of that uh, land area for your farming activities. And if it is within a water log area, you cannot do any form of fishing or any other activities there. So these are the kind of things that we have had with them. And I think, again, like I said, we we'll give credit to the host communities. They are, by and large, uh, accepting to have and live in a very clean and good environment. Bonga OSP happened precisely December, December 1920, December 19 slash December 20, 2011. And uh, it was as a result of a, it was a, result of a split ho, a hose in the course of offtake into a maritime tanker. And when that split happened, we had to call in international support by way of calling in Oil Spill Response Limited from Southampton in the United Kingdom. It came here just within uh, 36 hours and we started the operation. It took us just seven days to combat that spill and prevented it from hitting the shoreline. We prevented it from hitting the shoreline. Unlike, and that was because there was Nozdra and there was the capacity to do that. In 1998, there was a spill in that, in, in that manner in the facilities of uh, ExxonMobil uh, at Ibuno. When this thing happened, it traveled, the oil spill have traveled as far as Badagri in Lagos State. Of course, you know the distance along the coastline from Badagri, from Ibuno to Badagri in Lagos State, because there was the kind of uh, response uh, activities, the agency for instance was not there, National SP contingency plan was not there, 
So the direction was not actually there. So there was a difference. And of course, it takes days before an oil spill could move up to uh, Baragri in Lagos. There were uh, redeemable and irredeemable uh, losses as a result of that oil spill. And this we put together and we may put a sanction to SNEPCO as an agency of government. That sanction was there. We are still on it. The sanction was challenged, actually, by the SNEPCO. It's a subsidiary of SPDC. And I think they did not get the right judgment in the, in the, in the, in the, in the high court here, and they made an appeal. But unfortunately, our people, some people wanted to play smart, say so go to the shoreline, it this, it this, that. If you cannot provide credible evidence to show that you go to the shoreline, you just be wasting your time. Honestly, it's not a matter of sentiment. It's scientific if you want to really go into it. And uh, you now see groups, everybody say, go to their shoreline, go to their villages, and so on and so forth. How come? If only you know the location of Bonga. It's about 120 kilometers offshore. So how you travel and enter the villages around about there. So, so, so that you have, I can't even count the number of villages that claim that this thing got to them. But that was not the fact. The fact on paper did not justify that. Then you now see lawyers, different lawyers, going to court in Nigeria, going to court in the UK. For God's sake, we have our own judicial system in Nigeria. Nigeria is a republic and it's an independent nation, a sovereign nation. The OSP happened within Nigeria's territorial waters. So why go to a London court? Anyway, it's, it's a choice. And uh, the London court gave its verdict, and uh, so be it. I wouldn't comment on the London court uh, verdict, but it gave a verdict, and that's it. So uh, I think that's much I would want to say about that, because the cases in Nigeria are still on. I would want to go into the, go more than that, or that to just put what really happened in that incident in perspective. That's all.